I watched your interview with Darav- uh, with Stephen Bartlett on Darav- as CEO. I read most of your book and I was curious if you perhaps for our listeners could tell us a little bit more about your journey and, and how you came to these these beliefs, which are sometimes for me at least hard to believe. And then I heard about Ollie's sister and that story. And and as someone who considers himself a man of science and I I I'm just very fascinated by by your studies and your research and and yeah, I was wondering if you could maybe expand a little bit on, on your journey and how you came to, to your specific beliefs. Yeah, I um uh at, at at an early age I was very interested in what I was going to do with my life and um I came from a family of uh, uh, my father was an immigrant you know and he wanted me to to be successful in life and <clears throat> he wanted me to be a doctor you know and uh I studied got the grades and yet something in me during that time <clears throat> was telling me that something didn't feel right about doing that. Like, a, and I was just open-minded and I was reading and, um, I just couldn't jump into it. Went to college, you know, went to pre-med and studied pre-med and, and I just got interested in other things. Uh, you know, I started doing things I would never do. I started studying yoga and martial arts and there were just things I just weren't, wasn't, wasn't in my wheelhouse. You know, I played a lot of American uh, sports and this was something completely different. And and then I just started reading about uh, things that interested me. Like um, I wanted to learn without having to, uh, to to take notes. That's really what I was interested in when I was taking 20, 21 credits a semester. And then and I started looking into hypnosis. I wanted to hypnotize myself to be able to learn as much as I possibly could while I was in the classroom. So I could repeat the lecture back by the end of the end of the the, the lecture. And not have to study too much and just read a reference before the test and ace the test and do the things I wanted to do. Get my black belt, you know, do all the things that I was interested in doing. And so it took me a little bit of time to just kind of understand what hypnosis was. And then I I took my college loan uh, without my father knowing it. And I I, I took a lot of that money and, and went to school uh, in on the weekends and the evenings and really got uh, went through four really um, great levels of, of the study of hypnosis and became a hypnotherapist. And I was just fascinated <clears throat> in having a clinical practice at an early age in a holistic healing center, uh, seeing people heal from all kinds of different health conditions. Like, and, and somehow the mind was affecting the body. And I saw people change like from alcoholic, uh, alcoholism to smoking, uh, to uh, PTSD, to bulimia, to you know, all kinds of different things. I just saw the power of the mind right there and I was fascinated with it. At the same time, when I was driving uh, to graduate school, um, I, I came across a book that was about a yogi and the yogi was doing all kinds of crazy things that just I couldn't stop thinking about. And these were mystics and these were saints in the Himalayas. And that was nothing like I had been brought up, you know, in conventional religion. So I had this Is kind this of the, interest. Um, sorry, I was just asking quickly the I read in your book the story of the yogi who managed to imprint his hand into a rock. Are we talking about the same thing here? Is this a no, no. This was uh, Pramahansa Yogananda's book, Autobiography of a Yogi. And so that, that was kind of an, just kind of an, uh, wasn't Miller Rape, it was just that interest in all the saints and, and uh, the masters that he talked about. So I had this kind of interest in the subconscious mind. Um, I went uh, uh, a different route than medicine. Uh, it was more holistic. Um, and then I just had this kind of uh, crazy just interest in the Eastern world, which I never really even gave it much thought to. Um, and somehow I just, I grew a lot during that time. And then I got run over by a truck in a triathlon after I had graduated um, uh, chiropractic college and um, broke six vertebrae in my spine. And um, I was never supposed to walk again. And I went from a healthy young 24 uh, year old kid that was, you know, running a practice and super successful to um, possibly never walking again. And the surgery uh, for that procedure is called the Harrington rod surgery. And that's, in my case, they would take off all the back parts of my vertebrae from the base of my neck to the base of my spine and screw in these long stainless steel rods to kind of cantilever the, the compressed vertebrae, the six compressed vertebrae uh, off the spinal cord. So I had 
bone fragments on my spinal cord. And then I had the neural arch of one vertebrae kind of broken like a pretzel. It snapped and kind of compressed the cord. And so um, I had four opinions and everybody said surgery. And I said, no, I'm not going to do the surgery. And, you know, I think in 1980s, probably before you guys were born, uh, yeah. <laughs> this was not something you said to a to, to surgeons, especially the medical director of a very, very popular hospital in San Diego. And um, he thought I had a head injury. I mean, he they just could not believe I said no. And I just thought, God, everything I read uh, from all these mystics, everything I've seen in hypnosis and all these people, the power of the subconscious mind, the power of the mind, is it possible that my mind can begin to influence my body? And I was laying face down. I wasn't going anywhere. I thought if I'm going to be paralyzed, um, I might as well, I might as well toss the coin and I'm going to take a risk. And, you know, then that's when you really go from the bleachers to the playing field because it's no longer philosophy. Like, yeah. and I didn't find, I didn't know anybody that ever did done this before. I couldn't find anything. But what I did find was I was, I was interested in any information that could point the finger that it was possible. That's all I needed. <clears throat> so I read everything I possibly could read to help me remove any doubt uh, and any disbelief that it was possible. And because I wasn't going anywhere, I wasn't doing anything, I wasn't eating, you know, on restaurants, I wasn't training anymore, I, I couldn't go to my martial arts studio, I couldn't run yoga classes, I couldn't get on my bike, I couldn't do anything. I was basically laying face down, so I just thought, God, there's gotta be a way that the, I can make contact with this intelligence that gives us life, that keeps our heart beating and digesting our food and running, you know, trillions of functions per section in every, a second in every cell of my body. And I thought, I don't know how to heal it, but maybe it does. So I just thought I would just kind of give it a template, a design. And when I was satisfied with what I wanted, I would surrender <clears throat> that that idea, not to that greater mind and ask if it could do the healing for me. And it was really difficult to get my mind to do what I wanted to do during that time, I think, because when you're in crisis and I had to, was facing, you know, should I sell my practice? I'm never going to walk again. Uh, should I sell my home? You know, and, and, and I couldn't get my mind to do what I wanted to do because it was focusing on the worst case scenario all the time. And so it was pretty much a dark night of the soul, but I didn't give up. I spent hours doing it, hours and hours and doing it. If I lost my attention, I'd start from the beginning and I'd start all over again. And then at a certain point, it got easy. <clears throat> and from that point forward, I just started to notice. It took me three hours to do. I was able to do in 45 minutes. And I knew on some level that what I was doing inside of me in my internal process was starting to produce an outcome outside of me in my body. And the moment I saw that correlation where my pain levels went down and my sensory function started to come back and my motor function started to change, I knew at that moment that somehow that my mind was actually producing an effect on my body. And that's when it changed for me. So, um, and I just, and I just up on my feet in 10 weeks, I was back into my life and they were supposed to put me in a body cast and this whole thing. And, and um, I just made a deal with myself. And that deal was if I ever was able to walk again, I'd spend the rest of my life, you know, studying the mind body connection and mind over matter. And, and that's kind of what I've been doing since, uh, since that point. That's, that's fascinating. And it's an inspiring story. Would you, would you say you were surprised when you realized that you started to get this feeling back or, or did you somehow know the whole time? So I guess my question is, do you need to believe that it's possible for it to become possible? Well, um, I think, I think this is a really important point because we've not, I don't want to just limit this to me. Uh, let's okay. just talk about anybody because it's really the same thing. Um, We've seen people numerous times stand on the stage that were dealing with all kinds of chronic health conditions, you know, serious health conditions. And they said, you know, God, I really believed in this stuff. You know, I really believe the power of the mind. I really believe the mind could heal the body. I saw the testimonials. I saw people heal. I just never believed it could work for me. And that's really a chilling moment because that's the moment you, you really have to show up. <laughs> and that means if you if you don't believe in it, you really won't do the work, right? You'll just you'll you'll say you may believe in it, but you may not really fully believe in it. And so um so when you weigh what you know against what you don't know, you got to somehow bridge those two. And it's really common for us to doubt when we don't see any type of change, you know, uh you know, we do the work and all of a sudden there's no change and then we say it's not possible. Well, um, 
we're just not that good. Like it's not going to go away in, you know, one meditation or one process. It takes, it takes overcoming that disbelief. And many people in this work that heal from chronic health conditions, I'll ask them, why, why, why did you do your meditations three times in one day? And, and this is because their chemo wasn't working, their radiation wasn't working, the three surgeries didn't work, the drug trial didn't work, the gluten-free diet didn't work, the vegan diet didn't work. Nothing was working. And nothing changes in our life till we change. And so they were doing their meditations three times a day because they started disbelieving again. And they did the work to change that belief again. And, and, they, and they wouldn't get up from that meditation from their inner work until they believed again. And if you keep doing that over and over again, um, you start changing your biology. And that's exactly what what it takes to, to change. So the dark night of the soul then is when you theoretically or, you know, intellectually say, oh, yeah, that's possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then it becomes a different game when you say, is it possible for me? And yeah. so yeah. for me, I had the I had the it made sense to me that it was possible. I couldn't find any evidence that anybody had ever did it. You know, I looked everywhere. What is the science behind if it is possible? I couldn't find any science that could support it. Uh, so I had to take a leap and just remember everything that I learned. And now this was really my own personal initiation. I seen it work on, I read all the stories of the masters and the yogis. I saw so many changes in people's personal health right in front of my eyes. Um, in 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 the in the work in hypnosis, and so I so I thought that there was a possibility that it could happen. But the first six weeks of that process, uh, for the most part, was hell. Uh, it was the dark night of the soul because I can imagine I, I couldn't I couldn't get my mind to do what I wanted it to do, and that bothered me more than anything else. I could not. I kept focusing on what I didn't want to happen instead of what I what I did want to happen, and it took me an enormous amount of awareness, an enormous amount of energy to not default back to that disbelief. And it needs the overcoming of that disbelief and that doubt that opens right. the door for something to, to occur.